Hey everyone, this is Jack Bourne, and I'm here with a really special guest who I'll introduce in just a second. But first, you know, one of my favorite quotes is that success leaves clues. And that's why I love to bring on people who have been there, have done that, and they have some experience and wisdom to share. And so that's why I'm so excited to be having this conversation with Jerisha Hawk. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Jerisha is a sought after business coach and sales expert who grew her business from zero to $2 million in less than four years with organic marketing, a lean team and high profit margins. She helps high achieving industry experts launch scalable group coaching programs by packaging and positioning their intellectual property and uh, strategically repurposing live videos to generate new leads. Jerisha is on a mission to narrow the racial wealth gap by helping industry experts chart new career paths as profitable online coaches. Great to have you here, Jerisha. I am super pumped to be here, Jack. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Now, uh, in my in my research leading up to this call, I know that one of the things that you talk about is that entrepreneurs sometimes, especially online entrepreneurs, you know, we sometimes think that any sort of obstacle that we hit in our business or anytime we want to hit a new level of income in our business, we think about, oh, okay, we need to, we need to create something new. We need to create a new program, but you've had a lot of success. One of the things that you talk about with your clients from what I've seen is the fact that you had one program for many, many years and you're really focused in on that. And that's one of the things that you try to teach to your clients. Can it, maybe that's a good place to start. Um, is, you know, what, why don't you share with us what a lot of entrepreneurs tend to do versus what you try to guide your students to do? Yeah, I think in the online space and being an entrepreneur, like we shiny object syndrome and wanting to satisfy our, um, like our, our desire for trying and testing new things that we can, a lot of people in the online space, we're just business owners. We can get bored in our business which will make us, you know, jump from offer to offer or jump from marketing method to marketing method or jump from sales process to sales process. Um, and where I've personally had a lot of success financially and from also from a consistency and client results perspective and as well as our clients is, you know, finding ways to deliver, like to do what we've done well, having one core offer and figuring out a way to deliver it better, to make it better, to improve it over time. Um, and it's this process of consistent and continuous improvement and continuous refinement and like relaunching the exact same thing over and over and over again. Um, I mean, think about like, you know, one of my favorite brands is Coca-Cola. Like my grandma, she has no vices. She doesn't drink. She don't smoke. She doesn't gamble, but she drinks a Coca-Cola almost every day. And she raised me. And as a kid, she would put Coca-Cola in my bottle, which is you think about this one formula that this billion dollar company made and they still sell the exact same formula today, like Coca-Cola in the bottle, they're selling happiness in a red can. And it's been years they've been selling the exact same product. And I just think there's so much value of trust building, of uh, longevity that can be created when you are willing to, once you figure out and discover what your one thing is to actually fully commit to it and marry it to some degree, um, just like with marriage, there's, I've been married just only a year and a half. And I feel like I'm still learning my partner. I'm still learning how to, how to love him and how to receive love at a deeper level every day. Um, and you, the same thing happens with our, with our programs that we sell. And also with the consistency and client results that we can get when we do choose to commit and fully go all in on one thing. Yeah, that's, um, you know, you were talking about Coke and I'm, I'm dating myself here, but I, I remember when I was a, when I was a kid, I forget how old I was, but Coke to try to decided to mix things up and they came out with new Coke. And uh, as far as I can tell, it, it didn't, it didn't work very well. They eventually switched back to the classic. Um, you no, know, give so us they, the classic Coke. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's reliable. It's consistent. We know what to expect when we get it. And we want to pay, partly we're paying for that expectation. Be, yeah. that will be met. Yeah. Now let's, let's talk about something that a, a lot of course creators and coaches uh, have faced. I'm sure some people find that thing and they know what they're doing right out of the gate. And, you know, maybe it's a matter of just refining it, but they know like, this is what I'm going to be do doing. Mm -hmm. um, but for other people, they start in one area and they're not hitting it out of the park right out of right out of the gate, you know. And so they're wondering, you know, should I pivot to something else? Should I make a complete 180 degree change? Or is it a matter of I just need to keep focusing, focusing, focusing? So what sort of uh, tips can you give us in terms of 
when is it right to do a pivot or a major change or just, you know, stick with it? Yeah. Well, I want to make this for the record. I don't know anybody who had it figured out from the very first time. So I don't want to paint that picture. Like, I think honestly, it takes like three to five years to figure out what your one thing is. Um, I I wish more coaches and like mentors and advisors and marketers talked about that of like, how long does it actually take to figure out the thing that you're going to go all in on? Um, I wonder, I don't know how long it took you for you to figure out deadline funnels and like figure out this is going to be the software and this is going to be the primary way in which we go about it. But it took me three years, three, well, I feel like we're at a place now, but it took me about a good three years to get to a place where I know like, this is the, where I feel like we add the most market we add the most value in the marketplace at this current stage in time and where we, I think, offer a superior solution um, than what I'm seeing. You know, I feel like we're actually closing a real gap and filling a real need. It took like three, three and a half years. And so I feel like in those beginning stages, in those first, like if you have not been in business for more than three to five years, you might still be discovering what your one thing will be. And I like to look at it as like a lot, it's like dating. I always love using relationship analogies, but I think it's like dating. Like you're, you're testing the waters, you're um, going on different experiences, you're having different client uh, relationships, client experience, different price points possibly. And you're like figuring out, I think a lot of it is just discovering what your preferences are. And I think a lot of the time too, if you're a course creator or a coach and you're teaching something based off of your personal experience, what we have is uh, unconscious competence where we're unconsciously aware of the competence that we have. And sometimes people can come to us and we know exactly what to do to help them, but we don't know exactly how all this, like we, we can skip over steps. We don't realize exactly how we've been able to offer that support. And it takes time to actually have conscious competence of our expertise. Um, so I feel like in the beginning stages, it's, it's, it's a lot of trial and error, but I'm a really big person on making data informed decisions. Data is always informing my decisions and it always has been. I'm an engineer by trade. And I think having that background has been really supportive as an entrepreneur because being an engineer, you're kind of like taught to be a scientist in some regard, especially like in college. It's like, oh, I have this hypothesis. There's some data that I can use to help, uh, that I can measure against to help validate my initial assumption. And then if I can approach, and this, that's how I've always approached creating offers or uh, offering solutions in the marketplace is like, okay, there's this hypothesis that I have. These are the conditions in which I think this hypothesis will exist. And here are some metrics that I can measure myself against as I'm going through this to validate my assumption. And, you know, you do that enough time. So I, I like to use the data. And when I think about data from a course perspective or a coach perspective, I like to look at what was the promise that I initially sold people into, and then what was the percentage at which clients uh, actually achieved that promise, and how consistently and repeatedly can I deliver that promise through the design of my curriculum and of my content within inside of my program. So that's one metric I'm always using of like, did I deliver on what I promised and what percentage of my clients were able to get that promise and or better, but it that first starts by having an actual measurable program promise or some, some level of measurability to what it is that you're offering, but really data is always influencing and informing my decision. And I always will look for data to validate or to inform my intuition as well. It's, it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, but I'm very data driven in that regard. Yeah. So there's so many different directions I could go with this, but something that I'm, I, I, you know, something you said that I'm really interested in is, is there something that you've learned over the years that, uh, that you've built into your curriculum or that you've found that really helps your students actually take action? Because I know one of the yes. so kind of, it's, it's starting to be spoken, but one of kind of the unspoken sort of things about courses and also coaching is that even though we as the creator want all of our clients to succeed, sometimes people don't take action on what it is that we're getting, what what it is that we're offering. And I'm sure you've dealt with this as well. So what are some things that you found that help, help your clients actually put into action the formulas and the frameworks that you give them? So it starts before they ever buy. It's the qualification process. So when you're, I think this also depends on the type of offer that you're creating, the price point that you're selling at, and the level of rigor you want to include in your qualification process. But I think um, what we sell typically on the higher end, our programs are like five figures and up, and all of our clients are usually selling something that $3,000 to $10,000 price range. Um, but many of our clients were course creators before they 
elevated their offer and made it more of a high ticket, high touch group coaching program. And I think one of the, the first things that we've noticed of why clients may not commit to doing the work, especially as a course creator of a coach, it's a two-way commitment. Like it's our job to, you know, deliver on what it is that we promise, but the only way for the client to ever get the results is if they do the work and fully implement it. But I think that having an actual qualification process is really, really crucial if you actually want to increase the percentage rate of the, you know, of your clients getting the results. So we have about a 70 to 80% full return on investment for our, our like $18,000 program within the first 90 days. And pretty much 95% of clients, I mean, I'm trying to think like the, the few clients that don't re- get a full return on investment in the totality of them working with us is if like, I don't know, like they just choose no longer to like run their business or we like decide to part ways. Um, so very, very high, not program completion rate, but program result rate. And I think that's something even too, to think about as a course creator, like does the, I think sometimes course creators look at like, did my client finish my program versus did the client get the result that was promised of my program? And there's a lot of clients who don't need to watch every single module or complete every single worksheet in order to get the result that was promised. But I think it's really important to one, first qualify clients and know, okay, if if we know that clients meet these uh, attributes or these identity descriptors, or they fall in line with these qualifications, we know that there's a higher percentage that they will get the result, that they're actually prepared to get the result that we're promising. And that's, again, looking at past client data of successful clients of, you can start to notice those patterns. But then the second thing is that when we uh, had, you know, after we enrolled maybe like 30 clients into the program, we took a poll, we looked at the top like three to five clients who got, who met the full ROI at the fastest rate possible. And then we looked at, okay, what aspects of the curriculum did you apply in order to get the result and which aspects of the curriculum did you skip? And it's really interesting. You'll start to, again, notice patterns of like, that was a nice to have, but it wasn't necessary. Or this part right here, oh my gosh, when I did that, my, my results exploded or whatever it was. And that helped me to start to, um, you know, remove, I don't want to say the fluff, but remove nice to have curriculum versus like a necessary curriculum. And, you know, especially during the, the beginning onboarding or the beginning stages of being enrolled, really jam pack that with only things that we know that if, when clients took action on it, they got the result and there was no skipping of a step. Um, and we really like front loaded our programs to deliver on those results faster. So I think those are two things you can do to help increase your percentage of clients getting results is having a better qualification process before they enroll. And then secondarily, really studying how your clients are applying your curriculum and which attributes of what they apply uh, from your curriculum are actually leading to them getting the result and which parts they don't do and didn't impact them from not getting the results, if that makes sense. So um, this might not be applicable to everyone, but I'm curious, how how are you personally um, getting yourself and your brand in front of your audience? Because you've got a five-figure program. It sounds like you've got a pretty stringent qualification process, which means that not everyone who applies is accepted in, which, Mm -hmm. you know, as you mentioned, definitely improves your success rate, which also means that people are getting results, which, you know, it's it's a great positive sort of uh, flywheel. Like you bring in high quality people and you get high quality results and then your marketing is high quality. So I just wanted to point that out, um, which, you know, I'm just reiterating what you already said, but let me get back to my question. How, how are you with such a high price program and stringent qualifications getting your message in front of your audience? Yeah, we grow organically. Um, we've always had the best results through organic, like social media content. Um, I've always primarily focused on doing using live video. Um, when you're playing the organic game on Instagram, Facebook, any of these social platforms, they've over the years they've always prioritized. Uh, well, not always, but especially the last like five years, they've prioritized video based content over any other medium. So I've always done live videos, and over the years we've been strategically repurposing effective live video so that it can increase the reach. In, but outside of the live video and in regards to outside of the delivery mechanism that we use on the social platforms and how we repurpose content, what you, the the origin of your question is around the messaging. And we really focus on creating, uh, creating content that teaches people how to think versus telling people what to do. 
So it's not how to content. It's more of like, how do I, how do I think in more sophisticated content that aligns with the psychology of how people are making buying decisions. And I think when you can have messaging that is more focused on what are the questions, the beliefs, the objections, the fears that are influencing somebody's buying decision criteria versus just the how to the latest dance TikTok reel thing where it might be very entertaining, but it's not necessarily influencing what are the questions that they are considering when making a buying decision. All of our messaging is focused on that. Um, so that's where we initially start everything. We, we have a more, again, like psychology based approach to our messaging. And then from there, we deliver that through a uh, live video. And then the way that we've organically expanded our reach without having to have dependency or really any need for ad spend is through strategically, you know, repurposing that live video content into more bingeable, shorter, consumable content, podcast episodes, um, Facebook group content and, and so forth. But creating more sophisticated content that actually aligns with how people are making buying decisions by far is the core of how we create our messaging. So I'm a, I'm, I'm really, I love to nerd out on messaging. So um, just for a second, I would love, to, I would love to hear an example of, you know, not just for me, but for everyone watching, what would be an example that you've used recently where the content was not, here's how to do this, here's how to do X or Y or Z, but really yeah. something more around, um, well, I'll let you take the lead. Like in, what type of content are you putting out there that is bringing people a step closer to saying yes and becoming your client? Yeah, well, I think when we think about more sophisticated marketing content, I think it's really important to understand like the phases of awareness. Because um, if I give you an example without understanding the phase of awareness, it might not have full context. But when you, there's no, there's t there's Eugene Schwartz really coined this in um, breakthrough marketing back in the day, and I've learned a lot from that and have been adapting that to make it make sense for the online coaching industry and what it is that we do. But there's the three phases of awareness that we primarily focus on is unaware, problem aware, and solution aware. And unaware is really about helping what are the thoughts, the beliefs that have to be shifted in order for somebody to actually have a full conscious grasp of what their actual problem is as it correlates to what you believe their problem is and what it is that you offer. Then now that they're problem aware, okay, now that I'm problem aware, um, how do I now get a better understanding of what solution I should be uh, thinking about to actually solve my problem? And when they're solution aware, it's like, okay, now I'm solution aware. I understand what my problem is. I understand what solutions are available. Basically why you, and I'm giving you guys like the golden retriever, third grade level, two second explanation of this. Um, and part, like, part of our unaware content of helping people that we have to create and that we do create to even help people discover their problem is first that like why they should even be selling high ticket in the first place or like why they, you know, most half of our clients come from the agency world. They have really successful agencies done for you business models. They might have SaaS companies. They might have um, photography businesses, event planning, and they, they've, they want to add in a new revenue stream, but they don't know what revenue stream that should be. Should it be a digital course? Should it be a coaching program? Should it be one-on-one -on -one consulting? Should it be corporate contracts? There's all these options they can consider. So one of the very first pieces of content that we do create to get somebody from unaware to problem aware is that like, you know, you know, uh, why, you know, transitioning into the coaching space uh, is a really profitable option if you already have a successful done for you practice. And it's, and it's not telling them how to do it, but it's helping influence th their private thoughts of like, these are, again, when you start to think about what is the criteria, even for you, if you're listening to this, think about the last program that you bought or the last software that you purchased. I want you to think about what were some of those questions that you asked yourself to make the buying decision? You know, we were just chatting offline. I said, I used to use deadline funnels when I had webinars. There is a, I had a belief and I feel kind of ignorant now talking to you, Jack. I'm like, I thought that I only knew deadline funnels in context of running evergreen webinars. I didn't know there was other ways that I could be using deadline funnels outside of evergreen webinars. That's a piece of content of like, if you put out a piece of content saying like, you know, five ways to use deadline funnels that have nothing to do with evergreen webinars, that would like, oh, I didn't even know that that was even a, I didn't even know that was a problem or a potential solution to a problem that I even had because I was unaware. So it's really about, it's not like, I don't know, the tactical, like, 
how to set up, how to set up a deadline funnel in an evergreen email, but it's more about shifting the belief or overcoming the objection or introducing a new perspective that's aligned with how they're making buying decisions. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll give another example and you can tell me if I'm on the right track. So perhaps for you now, I'm not like whether I believe in what I'm about to say or not, like I, I'm just giving an example, but maybe a piece of content that you would create for your audience would be why creating a low price course is not going to get you to the goal, like to where you want to be. Oh, a hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. And so, and so you've essentially like, you've, you've taught them something like, okay, out of the universe of universe of different directions that I could go, I can eliminate this one, which was actually one that I was seriously considering. Okay. What else does Jerisha and her her team, you know, have to offer? And so like, okay, what else should I not be considering or what, what should I be doing instead? And so that brings them another step closer to you, which, you know, would be, you know, once you get them on the path of, okay, a high ticket group coaching, let's say, is where you want to go for these various reasons. Now you get into, well, how are you going to do that? And so that's where they would sign up to learn more or attend a live event of yours or something like that. Is it, am I yeah. on the right track? Yeah. Like one of our uh, content pieces recently, they did really, really well is like how to earn more than $300,000 a year working with 30 clients or less. And okay. that was like a, wait, what, what do you mean? I don't ha- I can work with like 30 people or less in a year and make more than 300 grand versus I think many of us. And I, I went down this path too. Like, I think regardless of which business model you want, it just really makes, you just have to commit to whatever business model you're stepping into. And if you're in a low ticket business model, it's a high volume game. But if you're not willing to do what's required to generate the high volume of leads, it can be really difficult for you to hit your revenue goals with a low ticket, like, you know, two or three or $400 program Um, versus, you know, I've never played the high volume. You know, I, I don't, we don't pay for ads. So we're not buying leads and we're growing organically. So it might mean that it takes longer. Like I still have a very small email list for how big our profit margins are and what our revenue is. But, you know, so that's a, that's a really great example of like how you can earn more than 300 grand a year working with less than 30 clients. Cause most people selling low ticket and they have to sell thousands or hundreds of their offer for them to have multi six figure businesses. Right. Yeah. And, and so just to take the other side, if someone was selling a program on how to be successful with like a $500 course, Mm -hmm. they might create a piece of content about why, you know, having even 30 to 60 clients just isn't the way that you want to go. And that's going to resonate with some people because like everything in life, I mean, everything's a trade-off. There's no perfect business model. There's, there's trade-offs. And so you can steer the people in the direction that ends up leading to, you know, to, to your course. So if it resonates with your audience, I mean, that's what your marketing messaging is supposed to do is to actually send some people away. Some people are going to say, no, I, I want high ticket. I want to deal with just 30 clients, but other people are going to go, you know what? I just want to be, you know, I want to be on the beach. Even if I'm making 150 grand, I would rather make 150 grand be on the beach rather than having to be on the call with, you know, 30 clients, you know, as an example. Mm-hmm. So, um, let's, so you can go let's, either way. It's just shifting yeah. the belief and introducing perspective that aligns with the philosophy that you teach and whatever it is that you're offering in your program. Yeah, absolutely. I, m- I remember, so w- one more quick example, way, way long ago, uh, you know, one of my first, First things that I did as an entrepreneur was I, I to keep money coming in um, was I would build websites for people locally. And I remember one of the, so I, I couldn't build necessarily the prettiest website, but I, but one of the things that I would say is, look, you know, you're, you know, a physician or an architect, look, you want the website, not because you want a pretty website, you want clients coming in the door. All these people who are going to build you a beautiful website, you know, that's you can't take a beautiful website and deposit it in the bank. I actually spend my own money on AdWords and all these other places. And if my marketing doesn't work, then you know, then I'm not in business. You know, so if you want someone who's going to bring you clients, then you, you know, so I would I would shift their criteria from who, you know, who can actually build me a website that actually brings me clients versus who's going to build the prettiest website that I can brag about. And so as soon as I shifted that messaging, like I was the only one because I would tell them, look, you should only hire someone who actually has their own skin in the game, you know, and so automatically I eliminated all the other options. So that's, that's an example of that type of messaging. 100%. Um, 
Yeah, I love geeking out on this, but let's, um, I want to make sure that we cover some of the other things and I know you have so much wisdom um, and experience to share. So um, maybe we could talk about, I've got some bullet points in front of me. One of them is, you know, where course creators miss the mark and growing their business online. Do you want to, do you want to take that and run with it? Yeah, I think this even maybe alludes to what we talked about earlier. I think a lot of course creators focus on, at least from my experience, it's like, I want people to finish my program versus mm. maybe measuring it against, did yeah. they get the result that was promised? Um, and I think that's a really important distinction because it might be really interesting for you to look at the client data and maybe recalibrate how you're defining success within your program um, uh, in a way that might be more aligned with what the client actually wants themselves. Um, so I think that's one thing that a lot of maybe course can I, creators. Can I maybe... pick up on that real yes. quick? Yes. Okay. So just I, you know what I think I think one of the things that some people struggle with is that you know they're talking about the features of their course or their coaching program, but they're not actually even making a promise because you're talking yes. about you know does your are your clients getting what was promised? But some people make the mistake of not even making a promise. Like they they say here's my course, but they're not saying here are the results that you'll get in this specific time frame, right? So. Um, and, and to your point, I've seen I've seen examples where um, I've even done this at live events where I got a big aha from maybe the third speaker on the first day. And I'm like, OK, I don't need to hear the rest of the speakers because I need to go back to my hotel room, get on a call with my team and talk about implementing this one thing. It doesn't matter what else is there. I'll get the recordings later. You know, I, I want to start implementing this idea right now. And so it's really about, you know. It's to your point, it's not about necessarily consumption, although it is an interesting metric to follow. It's about, you know, do you have a promise and um, of, of results and are your clients getting those results? So I think that's really smart. And um, I think that that's like our industry, like it, consumers are becoming smarter and smarter and smarter and the industry is becoming more sophisticated. Like it used to, I think, I think even consumers are going to have, I don't say higher expectations, but I don't know. I've bought, I've bought so many courses that have no promise. And it's like you buy all these courses living on this virtual shelf that like you've consumed a lot of information around that. And maybe that's the purpose of them. Maybe the promise is that you'll just become more informed about a particular topic. But if your course is actually designed with some uh, tangible or, you know, result in mind, like be bold in claiming that. And I think you claiming that will, like you said, most people do not have a program promise. And most people are, I know a lot of folks, my clients included, have sometimes resistance to claiming a promise or offering a guarantee because of all, there's a ton of figures they have associated with it. But I think that that's something that will immediately differentiate you. And very similar to even what you were saying about the websites you created back in the day of like, not just we're going to create a website for you, but we're going to create a website that we know that we can track and that will produce, you know, it will help you with converting leads into whatever it is that, you know, your practice or whatever. And so I think having a program promise is, um, I think it's like off rip when you, if you have a program promise, you typically can immediately charge more, but I feel like it also helps so much with uh, the ripple effect of like referrals and client results because you can measure against it. And I, I don't know. I know for me, I want somebody who can measure my success. And I think all the anger that many of us have had from the traditional education system, even though I went to college and I'm very glad that I have a degree. And I'm that glad that the profession I took actually was able to pay for the student loans that my degree, you know, I, that I purchased. But how many of us have gone to school and gotten all this information, but it didn't necessarily matriculate into something that we expected it to matriculate into? So I think that that's a way that um, missing the mark of one, clarifying a program promise and being able to actually design your program curriculum to deliver on the promise that people, you know, that you communicated when they purchased um, and focusing on, cons you know, consumption is a really important metric with consumption of the right material within your program that again, everything goes back to delivering on that promise that you can measure. So I know uh, something else that we wanted to cover was um, how to articulate value to increase sales. So, um, you know, even though you're an engineer, I love the fact that you are so dialed into messaging and that's such an important part of what you do. Um, so I, I would love for you to talk about, how, you know, some of the things that you share with your clients in terms of how do you, how do you increase sales without necessarily doing a discount? How do you, how do you message it in a way that adds value? 
Yeah. And I'm being an engineer. I love the data. I love the data around like messaging and what sticks and what didn't and what resonated and what converted. Um, but when I think about articulate like sales, I think really boils down to like three things. Um, the value that you deliver, the value that you can articulate and the demand that currently exists. And the kind of the conversation that we were having earlier around your messaging. And I think articulating your value, it's like what attribute of your value have you been articulating within your marketing content? If you were to like pause this recording or after this recording, go back and look at the content that you've published on wherever you typically talk about your offer, really think about, am I trying to prove my value in regards to what it is that I deliver? where I'm educating them on the process of what we do once they're inside of the program, um, which would be really great internal program marketing content, maybe not the best front face marketing content, or am I creating content that's influencing how they're thinking and how they're making a buying decision before they get to the point of purchase. And I think when we can start to like separate that line of demarcation of what needs to be communicated to help them get to a place where they're ready to make a buying decision, whether that decision is yes or whether it's no, but what's the content and the messaging and again, those beliefs, objections, perspectives um, that align with how they're making a buying decision, what needs to be communicated just to get them ready to make a purchase. Most people are creating content like in solution aware or like somebody who is already like hyper, hyper, hyper aware where they're creating content that's really designed for like the person after they purchase and they've already started to get indoctrinated into their system. So when we're trying to articulate our value to increase sales, it's um, we have to retrain our brains a little bit to, you know, that you're an expert and you're a beast at what it is that you do. And like, you can go ham and help everybody and get them the results, but you have to put yourself back in the shoes of like, what was this person thinking? What were their beliefs? What were their objections before they made the, before they made the investment, before they got indoctrinated into my belief system? And I think when we can start articulating their value from that angle of positioning or from that perspective, it, do, it increases, I mean, I guarantee you it'll increase your sales. So a way that you can practically do this um, is if you guys either are like recording your sales conversations or if you have direct message combos with clients or um, even when, right when people join, if you have an intake form that you can have them fill out when they buy your course of like, you know, you can literally, we document every objection that we get and we document every question that was asked before somebody purchased. And those doing those two things can give us insight on what their beliefs are that are influencing how they're making their buying decision. And we can create more marketing content that, that articulates the value around what's important to them when they're making a buying decision. Um, and the more that we can do that front facing in our marketing content and publicly, it will help with the private conversions when they're by themselves. I know I've bought many of courses laying in bed at like two in the morning um, or when they're privately making that decision on a sales conversation or something like that. I, I know this is specific to you, but I'm curious, do you have uh, on your team or, or do you have people who are, I don't know if you'd call them sales calls, but are you essentially, um, maybe they're qualification calls? Like, like what is the structure that you use when someone raises their hand and says, hey, I want to join your program? And you, first of all, I would imagine there's an intake form. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. We have two different variations. Um, up until maybe nine months ago, we had a sales call closer uh, or I was closing on calls. For the last nine months, we've been closing all clients through direct message on Instagram or on Facebook. So how are, we call it our champagne closer method. Um, I'm really into like, like that would be like my altar. If I blow up my online business, I would go into luxury real estate or something. But when you're selling a really high-end house, it's really the, uh, Really, all you have to do is pop the bottle of champagne because the house sells itself is kind of the analogy. Um, but how we do this champagne closer method or how we think about sales is one, they will apply for our program. And when they apply, that goes through our qualification process, there's qualification questions that we ask. Then we will do a short DM conversation just to like ask any clarifying questions about what their application, what they submitted on the application to first verify, do they align with who we know our best clients are? And then secondarily, do we actually think our program promise can deliver on what they're asking for? Um, and then if we do that a little bit of qualification through DM, the next thing that we send them is a benchmark assessment. And this has a really been a really instrumental tool for us is that this assessment is like 30 to 40 minute video that helps them self-evaluate based off of what our curriculum is, where their gaps currently exist. So that video almost serves as a way for them to qualify themselves for our program. And our application and our conversations allows us to qualify them. So it's like a two-way qualification process. They're, that assessment helps them qualify 
themselves to know whether or not we're a good fit. After they finish their benchmark assessment, they share their score with us. And then we continue the conversation through direct message. Um, and our approach or how we teach our clients and how we've always approached it, it's very permission-based. It's very consent-driven. Um, and our goal with any sales conversation is not to get a yes. It's just 100% to help this, to get them to make a decision, whether that decision's a yes or a no. So it just it alleviates energetically some of the pressure of like, oh my God, I got to get the sale to like, oh my gosh, I just have to get them to make a decision. We don't want anybody lukewarm. We either want a hard yes or like a hard no. And like 80% of those no's are just not right now's, which is totally fine because we'll just follow up with them in the future. So there's an application process. Then we have an assessment video for them to self-assess themselves. And then we have uh, some sales conversation, whether that can be done through a sales call, which most of our clients, and I recommend you should start with sales calls just so that you can get that client data. But what I mentioned earlier about all those objections and those beliefs, you can document those things and those become marketing content for you to put out front facing. But we've been doing it for the last like nine months now, all through direct message. So application, uh, some level of self-assessment and then a sales conversation that happens privately through DM or through a call. Um, and then one, one last question on your process. Are you, are you constantly intaking new clients or do you have an enrollment period? And then there's sort of a, a class that we've that, done like, both. Okay. Um, and I think it just depends on your capacity. Like ours has just depended on what our capacity has been operationally. Um, I'm a really big, like how I approach businesses. I, uh, there was a season where it was open enrollment, right? When we first started, we did like three open close launches, probably like every three months. And then we went to evergreen enrollment or like recurring enrollment where, but we controlled it. We enrolled like three to five clients a month over a six month period. Cause I think two, one thing that we've learned, cause we're selling high ticket. It is a high touch program. Um, is that we didn't want to over and like, we didn't want to oversell where we didn't have the operational back end to support the amount of new clients coming in the door. So we've been very intentional about figuring out where that bandwidth is and like what our threshold is. So we've done it both ways. I did open close enrollment. Then for about a year and a half, we were like evergreen enrollment. People could join every, every month. Um, we would, like I said, we started off where we control the number, like three to five new clients for about six months. And then the last six months, it didn't matter. We would enroll how many ever people were qualified that applied. But then um, about maybe six months ago, we switched it back to open close. Um, and that's because our philosophy has changed a little bit different. And also we're, uh, we recognize that maybe about 70 clients in the program, like our operational and how we design the, pro how we deliver the program had to evolve in order to handle more client load. So we've been really taking the time to put those operational things in place, being able to, you know, introduce different group coaching call formats, uh, introduce different delivery mechanisms from how we coach clients, closing any, you know, increasing like the learner accessibility within our program. Now we've added like closed captions, like we're in that process right now. Um, so we're going to continue to stay in open, like launch based enrollment or like very like structured open close enrollment, probably for another three to six months. Um, and we're, but we're testing, trying, we're, we're also testing whether or not we're going to go back to like a, a monthly enrollment cadence. So we've done it both ways, but it's just been really dependent on what operationally we could handle. Um, cause I've never wanted to be in a place where we over, where we could have like over enrolled too many clients where operationally we weren't ready to like deliver at the level of excellence that we guarantee. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> I know um, one more thing that we wanted to talk about, if if we have time, um, is the difference between revenue and profit. And I think I think all of us understand the difference, but in in terms of how it applies to the course creator or the coach or the consultant, you know, what what is your philosophy, and and how does this come into what you teach your clients? Yeah, like I used to have so much shame personally because I'm like I didn't have six figure launches. I'm like, I felt like it took, you know, too long, quote unquote, to make my first million dollars. And then I remember one day being at a mastermind event and I was doing maybe like 300 and I don't know, $35,000 that year in business. And the guy next to me was probably making close to like 2 million. And I had like, I'm, like, I'm just like big, bright eyed, bushy tail, just like in awe. And then the, during the session, we had to share what we actually made profit. And I had made more profit than him. And it was a mind-blowing experience for me. I'm like, wait a minute, he does $2 million in revenue. 
I'm like a fraction of what he does revenue wise, but how did I make more profit cash than he did? And that really opened my eyes to, I think in the online, online marketing space, what can get glorified a lot of the time is like how big my launch was or how much revenue I made. Um, And I think very rarely, I mean, these are private companies, they don't have to publicly share their numbers, but I think very rarely is there, I think, healthy dialogue around, um, you know, what your profit margins are and, and how much profit you actually made. And that was a really defining moment for me. And I think also being a woman of color, like, you know, many, I started way back in the negative when I basically coming out of the gate, like, you know, you, there's debt that you may be born into or, um, uh, that you've accumulated over your lifetime. And I think so many people are focused on like, how can I just get debt free? When you recognize that debt free is $0, that's the starting line in a capitalistic American society. Like you're at the beginning. That's not like, it is an accomplishment, but to me, I'm like, I want it more than just to get to the starting line. And I recognize how can I use my business as a vehicle to increase my personal net worth? And that's when, and kind of this conversation, I, I'm, I married a man who manages a hedge fund. So he also has definitely influenced my perspective on like wealth building and just thinking about profit from a different vantage point than maybe what we're traditionally introduced to in the online marketing space. But in that experience that I had really shifted my, my perspective. And I, you know, again, I used to have so much shame because I'm like, I'm not hitting these numbers that's marketed to me, but my profit has always been very, very healthy and very high. Um, which was the goal for this season of business that I'm in. That's my owner's intent right now was to build my personal net worth. So I hope that this is something that like, you know, it can be so easy for us to compare ourselves to people on social media or to these highlight reels. Um, and I think what's really more important is for you to pause and say, okay, during this season of business, what is my owner's intent? Is my owner's intent to grow my revenue, which, you know, it should be, but like, is my owner's intent to actually maintain a certain level of profit in the business every year? And when you can recognize, you know, define what your owner's intent is around what you want your numbers to actually look like, that will allow you to make more, I think, strategic and informed business decisions when you're going to market. So like, you know, for me with, I wanted to get to a million dollars profit and a and million dollars of personal net worth outside of my business. And th- this past year as I did it, this in 2021, we did a million dollars in profit and my personal net worth exceeded a million bucks, which was like, this all happened within five years. And I still feel really weird saying it out loud because it's, uh, I don't know. It's like, I haven't settled into it yet. But when I, when I look at that and that was my owner's intent for the last three years, when I got conscious about it, that's the reason why we haven't done paid ads. That's the reason why we haven't tried to sell like two or three or four different offers. Having that intention almost served as my blinders to keep me focused. Um, but I don't know. So I think that like it's there, there's not one isn't better than the other. But I think thinking about it, is this a lifestyle business for me? How do I want my how do I want to use the business, the vehicle of my business to impact my personal net worth and impact the financials at the end of the day after taxes, after expenses um, and allow that to be healthy, allow those preferences to serve as healthy constraints to how you're making operational decisions in the business. Um, and also just like, I hope that me sharing this also relieves some pressure because I know I used to feel so much shame and so much pressure about not hitting these quote unquote revenue goals. Um, but when I talk about my profit, then it was like, Oh, snap!" but nobody really talked about that as much publicly. So it really helped me to be conscious of how, who I was comparing myself to and to catch myself. Cause you really don't have the full picture a lot of the time. Um, so it's helped with my mental health as well. Yeah, I've, I've had that same experience as well. Um, I'm trying to think about how to phrase this, but I was recently, so there's a little private mastermind group that I'm in. And I remember one of my questions was, you know, around like, hey guys and gals, how are you? Like, how are you? And like for, for, for a nest egg, that's approximately in this range. Cause I didn't want to give an exact number. Like, you know, what, you know, how would, how, how would you guys invest it? I just kind of assume that and like everyone's like, oh, well, like for, for nest egg, you know, of that size, because mine is like in quotes, like, you know, dot, 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 because mine is so much bigger, you know, like here's what I did at that point. And the replies that I got back was mostly like, I don't know, because I'm not at that point yet. And it was just kind of like, it was an eye opener to me. And I'm not saying that to brag, but I totally, I totally get what you're talking about because, you know, I, I've also known some JV managers um, who have run some of the, you know, eight figure launches 
possibly even some nine figure launches in the real estate space. And um, I've had some really in-depth conversations with them. Some of them uh, I've recorded where, um, you know, they're, they're just sharing like, look, these, the, like the bigger the launch is, typically they're like almost none of that money is actually hitting the business owner's bottom line. Now it builds their list tremendously. And from that, like there, there can be strategic reasons for doing that. But when you hear like, oh, this person did a $2 million launch or $6 million launch, you know, don't assume that the profit margins that you're making on your $350,000 coaching business translate over to that. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, like that person made $2 million in, the, in their bank account. And it doesn't, doesn't actually work that way. Um, I love so what it, you just said is the strategic decision. I think yeah. it's important for us as business owners and you listening to this to say that if you're sacrificing like the, the strategic decision behind why they made the choice because maybe like it makes sense to break even on this huge nine figure launch because of the leads and they know what they're going to be able to sell on the back end. They're thinking about maybe the 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 return on investment over the next two years versus like that immediate cash collected or something. Um, but I think that's a really important thing is like allow be, allow it to be an intentional choice mm-hmm. versus like a happenstance or you know an unconscious thing when you realize at the end of the day when you process all your numbers and everything and it's like oh crap what happened it was like well. That probably wasn't a strategic decision. Yeah, and and I want to pick up on something you said uh, real quick, and maybe we'll close it out. Um, but you know, you mentioned I think you mentioned the word season, and you know, if if you did, that's something that you know yes. I've I've become a big believer in because I think there's a season. Like, I think we naturally go through different types of cycles, and you know, there there are times where we're like, okay, I'm gonna really push and focus, and then there's, there's sometimes it's like, you know what, I need a break, I need to coast, and then there's sometimes where you know, profit maximization is, you know, is, is what you're trying to do. And then there's other times where I just went through a season of investing in the team and bringing on additional personnel, like, and it's sort of like doing a launch in the sense that, okay, yeah, this is definitely going to impact the bottom line, but I'm bringing on these A-class people that, you know, over time are going to be able to take the business to the next level. And so that's a very intentional strategic decision, which has a short-term investment cost, you know, but long-term, if, if I've made the right decision, it's going to pay off. So I love the idea of seasonality in your business. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. hundred percent. We're in the same boat right now. We haven't enrolled any new clients over the last two months. Um, but we've been hiring our first, like our first set of like core full-time hires. And it's like, you know, we're taking, we're kind of slowing down so that we have, we're well positioned to speed up when it makes sense too. So yeah, I think owner's intent aligning with the season that you are in is just so critical so that you actually can make, like you mentioned, those strategic decisions. Jerisha, this has been just a a really, really enjoyable conversation. And I really appreciate you taking the time to to share your wisdom. Um, I want to make sure that the, the, the people who are watching this and thinking, how can I, how can I find Jerisha and like, how can I get deeper into her world and find out more about, you know, her programs and maybe go through that, that qualification process. Uh, so, you know, where, where, where can people go? Tell us, tell us where you would like to send folks. Yeah. My favorite thing to do at the end of interviews is my ask is that take a picture of you listening to this interview right now, whether that's on the camera screen or in your earbuds or whatever, and tag both Jack and I, are you on Instagram? I am. I'm not super active. I'm not like you. It's all okay. right. <laughs> I, I, tag- I post. I post videos of me kite surfing. Like that's okay. That's cool. Basically. We're gonna be kite surfing <laughs> and chopping it up. But t- tag us on Instagram stories. I'm at Jerisha Hawk. I'm I'm Jerisha Hawk everywhere. JerishaHawk.com. Jerisha Hawk on Facebook. But tag us on your Instagram stories. I always would love us to continue the conversation. So just tag us on IG stories and let us know what your top takeaway was. Um, that's my favorite way to. Like that's the best place to find me. And I think in a way for we can continue the conversation from what you have already heard today. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I know that I picked up some really, really big gems and I know that this was eye opening for a lot of people. So again, I, I just really want to thank you. I feel like you and I are on the same page in uh, so many different areas. So this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me.